Hello everyone, I'm Bridget Ayer and um, I'm the host of All About the Grace and on this channel we talk about faith, culture and media awareness and um, if you haven't clicked subscribe, please do subscribe to my channel, it helps me out, mainly it saves me time and uh, you get immediate uploads and there's a little bell you can click too so that'll give you the immediate upload um, notification. Um, so today we're going to be talking uh, with Father Vince, he's my guest, uh, he is, um, he has many hats, he is a pastor at it, appropriately, St. Michael the Archangel. Uh, we'll get it. Maybe we'll get into that. St. Peter uh, Catholic Church in Brookville, and then you also um, are, I guess, the pastor of Holy Angel, Holy Guardian Angel Oratory, which I'm not even sure what that is. Is that a? Is that a? a, a, a that was what a parish that. That's a parish that closed. Okay. And it's absorbed into St. Michael's here in Brookville. Okay. So you could say that St. Michael's has two campuses now. Okay. And so, and our guest is uh, Father Vince Lampert. So, and you're also the exorcist, which is that is our topic is going to be about um, evil, the devil, and how to not get mixed up with that. So, welcome, Father Vince. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. And you have you have like a great background. What is that picture back there? Is that uh, Jesus? I can't quite tell with holding the Eucharist up. It is. That's exactly right. So uh, that, is, that'll keep. I mean, I'm sitting. sitting in the dining room. I don't normally come into this room. <laughs> so I thought this would be a good location. It is. We're we're all doing things differently now uh, in the uh, pandemic and quarantine and all that. And um, while uh, before we got started here, uh, you said that you're working on a book. So tell us about that. Yes, I was asked to write a book on exorcism. So with all the extra time I have now during the pandemic, I found uh, a great opportunity to really get a lot of it done. So it's still in the stages. It's scheduled to be completed by June the 30th, and then with a release date of early next year. Oh, well, congratulations on that. That's really awesome. And uh, before we get started, I'll go ahead and do a plug for my book. I have a, <laughs> since we're talking about books, that's not really our topic today, but um, uh, Breaking New Ground, Discipleship Using New Media. And really, um, it's all about evangelization using new media. And we also, Father Vince and I also started laughing about how um, we've all kind of been <laughs> had to learn a lot of this on the fly so um, and, and you even mentioned that many what well, there's a grant for uh, churches now to, to uh, get into that tell me about that yes the Center for Congregations based in Indianapolis which is funded by EI Lilly is making a five thousand dollar grant available to every church regardless of denomination in the state of Indiana as a way to help churches, you know, we were all caught off guard. So it's a way of helping us to get up to speed on using technology in our churches. Well, that's really awesome. Well, our topic today is, um, I guess, evil, the goodness of God, which is really what we always want to be talking about. But what what is an exorcist? Tell us a little bit about your training and um, you know, maybe how many exorcists there are in the world and how you got into all this. I, I always ask a lot of questions, so. Uh, I like know. questions, that's a good thing. Good. I've been a priest now for about 29 years. June the 1st will be my 29th anniversary. And I was appointed the exorcist for the archdiocese by Archbishop Daniel Beekline back in 2005. And then after he appointed me, I studied and trained in Rome the church says the best way to learn how to be an exorcist is to um, work under a seasoned exorcist. So I went to Rome, lived there for three months. A Franciscan priest allowed me to participate in uh, 40 exorcisms the time that I was there and that I was able to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who were up against the forces of evil and were seeking the help of the church. So when you got this appointment, were you <laughs> surprised? <laughs> yeah. Yes, the former exorcist was uh, Monsignor John Ryan. Yeah, I know Father away. John. Yeah. Yes, he passed away back in July of 2005. He was actually uh, the pastor of St. Anthony when I attended eighth grade at All Saints. They're on the west side of Indianapolis. Yeah. I when he passed that. away, I think all the priests believed that the archbishop was looking for a replacement. So we were all trying to stay under the radar. <laughs> and I was at the archbishop's residence for a meeting. 
And when I arrived, he looked at me and said, I'm appointing you to be the exorcist for the archdiocese. And I think my jaw dropped. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. So, um, wow. So were you, when you first, I guess when you were the apprentice of, of the exorcist, you know, in your apprenticeship or training, I mean, were you afraid at any point, like when you kind of got started in this or have you ever been, you know, just thought, I don't think I want to go in there. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, I had to ask you that. There's question. always, there's always some apprehension. Now evil doesn't, I'm not terrified of it. A natural reaction when somebody jumps out at you, you know, you're going to jump back. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between being startled and being afraid. And this is certainly not anything that terrifies me or makes me afraid because I know that the power of God is always greater than the power of evil. And everything the devil is doing is to try to instill fear because if we give in to fear, our faith is diminished. So the key ingredient in exorcism is faith. Because obviously faith is the opposite of fear, right? Scripture says perfect faith cast out fear. Right. So uh, we got to work on our faith there. So let me ask you this. Um, I have so many questions, but how's been how's business been lately? Not since the quarantine, but um, just in general, I mean, it seems to me just kind of as a journalist in observation, as a mom, you know, living in this culture, it just seems like things have really gone south in terms of so many things. Well, faith, that faith is in decline. Yes. Yeah. And so the result of that, I mean, faith in God leads us in one direction. The lack of faith will lead us in another. I currently get about 1,800 calls and emails a year from people all over the United States, all over the world. Some exorcists are publicly known, such as myself. Others choose to remain anonymous. And since my name is out in the public forum, I probably get a greater number of callers. So have you seen um, an increase in calls or... I mean, do you think that there's been, are people more likely to reach out or, okay, so I guess maybe there's two questions there. Do you think evil has increased since you started in 2005? Or has there I, been, no, go ahead. Has there been, um, has business increased, <laughs> for lack of a, lack of a better uh, term, uh, since you started? I always say that I don't believe the devil is up to his game, okay. but I think people today are more likely to play his game. And I think that's attributed to the fact that many people today no longer practice their faith. Maybe as Catholics, they grew up in a traditional Catholic home. They were baptized, made first communion, maybe even went to Catholic school, went to uh, Sunday religious ed. But a lot of these people now have abandoned their faith. And because of, again, because faith has become less relevant in the lives of these people, they may be making themselves more vulnerable to evil. Because what's interesting is that at a time when people have kind of turned a blind eye to God, things that have to do with the demonic are on the rise. You turn on TV today, there's a great number of shows about the devil, about evil, ghost hunting, paranormal activity. There's a great fascination with all those things, but the fascination with God seems to be diminished. Now, what's interesting is that when people contact me, oftentimes it's not in the context of faith, meaning there are people who view the Catholic priest as a wizard. Mm. I have my own bag of tricks and my incantations that I could use to dispel evil. But the most important thing that people should realize that in an exorcism, Jesus is not a bystander. He's the main actor. So even the priest is acting in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. But it's always about what God is doing. If we're relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on God, that's the place to be. So you're clarifying that, that Father Vince is not a wizard? <laughs> <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll keep that as a takeaway. So, um, so how do people contact you? I mean, do you do people find you like just 
I mean, I'm not trying to give you more business, but how do the calls normally come in? I'm not, I'm not telling you to put your email out there or anything, but how do people contact you? I mean, how do, how do you get your clients, for lack of a better... They come in two ways. Okay. People can go on the internet and they Google the topic of exorcism and the priests that are publicly known, our names will pop up and people do research. In the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, we have a protocol so there is a, some procedures that the archbishop has put into place. You know, the number one thing that people should do is contact their local parish priest. I always think about, you know, when, you, when you're not feeling well, you go see your doctor, your general practitioner, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. If there's something that perhaps needs to be looked at, you know, in a uh, different way, then they may send you to a specialist. So to me, the exorcist is the specialist. But people should always begin with their parish priest. Now, what's interesting is that more than half the people who contact me are not Catholic. Yeah, they come I, from other faith traditions, Christian traditions, other world religions. Sometimes no faith background whatsoever. But the church does view exorcism as a ministry of charity, so the church will help and respond to anyone who reaches out to her who believes they're up against the forces of evil. Now, the number one thing, though, is that people have to follow the policies and procedures that the church has put into place. Well, I was I I in preparing for this interview, I learned a lot. I listened to several videos, long, long video, I mean, over an hour. And I, I just was so fascinated. I'm, I'm riding the exercise bike and I'm listening. And I, I didn't. I, I like that. You were on an exercise bike watching <laughs> exorcism. <laughs> You were exercising. I was, boy. It was, it was good. I was getting a good workout in there too. Oh my gosh, that's too funny, Father. Um, I, I forgot my question, but um, oh, oh, that that I didn't realize that you get calls from people who aren't Catholic. So that's, I thought that was really fascinating. Well, people today, I mean, it, it's really interesting. As I was thinking about this, there's such a dichotomy. You've got a lot of fascination with with evil and ghosts and paranormal and psychics and all that. But then at the same time, you've got a lot of people that don't believe in the devil, say all oh, that's a joke, it's not real. So is the devil real? Is evil real? How, how do we know that, that, that evil's real? And what is the devil's goal anyway? Well, the devil's goal is the conquest of civilization. You know, he wants to destroy humanity because he wants humanity to fall into eternal damnation as he has and the other fallen angels. The belief in the devil and other evil spirits uh, has always been an official teaching of the church. We find it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, documents of the popes. It was Pope Paul VI back in 1972, I think, that kind of got everybody's attention when in a series of uh, Wednesday uh, general audiences, he began talking about the devil. And I think many people believe that after the 1960s and all the revolutions that took place then, that the church had moved on from belief in the devil. But he did want to reinforce the fact that the church still believes in a personified evil that we call the devil. So evil is not just something of our own making, but it is something real and concrete. And if you go back to um, go back to Genesis and explain what happened there for people that maybe don't know the story of of where the devil originated and the you know all that. <laughs> yes, there's some there's some uh, great teachings out there. Saint Augustine talks about when were the angels created, and uh, in one of his books he says that if you in the very beginning of the book of Genesis God says let there be light. Most people, when you think of angels, you think of lighted creatures. The light that they radiate is the glory of God. And what's interesting is that he says, God said, let there be light, and it was good. And then the light was separated into day and darkness. But God didn't say the separation was good. So kind of treading very cautiously, he says that in that statement, one can see the, the creation of the angelic creatures. And then those who chose to rebel against God fell into darkness. And then you, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how uh, 
the devil when he rebelled against God. One third of the stars fell from the sky. And again, stars sometimes are looked at as angelic creatures in scripture. So one third of the angels fell with him. And then they became, you know, it was Lucifer who was closest to the throne of God. He fell. One third of the angels fell with him. And then he became Satan. And the fallen angels became the evil spirits. And I think people, well, people like to hear about all the really extraordinary things of the devil. I know that you mentioned that in various talks that people like to hear all the really crazy things that you've experienced. And maybe you can tell us a couple stories about that. But I think that the point that you were making in one of the talks I heard you give at um, Holy Rosary, a men's conference, you said something that the, it's not so much the extraordinary ways that the devil gets us, but it's really the ordinary ways that the devil gets us and, and how, the, how really more people need to be concerned about that because that's more prevalent. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about that just briefly if you can? I know you gave a whole hour talk on that. So <laughs> I'm asking you to, I'm asking these big questions that you got to give like these short answers to, but, but go ahead. Yeah, try to give I'm them. happy to. So the church recognizes four types of extraordinary demonic activity. Okay. Infestation, sure. demonic presence in a location or with an object. You can have demonic vexation, which are physical attacks that one is receiving from a demon. Demonic obsession, which are mental attacks the devil is trying to get into your head. And then demonic possession, whereby the devil or some other evil spirit takes control of a person's body treating that body as if it were its own. People are fascinated by all of that, but the church does say it's really the ordinary activity of the devil that people need to be wary of. And uh, he uses a four-stage plan of attack. It's deception, division, diversion, discouragement. So the deception, the devil wants us to buy into his lies. He did that with Adam and Eve in the garden. He does the same thing with us. When we buy into his lies, the deception leads us to division. We're broken. We're alienated from God. After Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They went and hid. Yeah. They hid. So they're, they're broken. And then the brokenness leads to diversion, meaning we're no longer on the path of God. We go off in a different direction. And then the diversion then leads us to discouragement. We lack any sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. And you look at the world today, we began by looking at that a little bit, but there's a lot of people today that have rejected God, which has left them broken, which is people out there wandering aimlessly looking for meaning and purpose. And there's a lot of people discouraged today. You look at it when you go to the grocery store, uh, Pope Francis talked about the long faces on people. There's just no sense of joy now, when we arrive at discouragement, we have two choices, I believe. We can go to discipleship, meaning we recommit ourselves to God. Pope John Paul II talked about the new evangelization. We need to rediscover our Christian roots, or it could lead to death, spiritual death, and sometimes even physical death. You look at the number of suicides today on the rise, where people just kind of lose all sense of hope. So I think to me, that's the role of the church, my favorite definition, is that the church is the guardian to the tree of life. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were banished from the garden. Mm -hmm. But Christ gave us the church to get us back to eternal life. And the devil believes that if he can destroy the church, then humanity will be trapped in sin permanently, as are the devil and his angels. So how, how do people... And I know you kind of answered this, but how do people get mixed up in the devil? It seems like, or evil, it seems like, I guess a lot of what I've heard, just in terms of some of your talks, is that maybe people aren't trying to willfully connect with the devil. Mm -hmm. It's kind of they accidentally get mixed up, whether it's just kind of drifting away from their faith and looking for looking for love in all the wrong places basically you know? <laughs> that all yes. stuff, you know um but you know seriously i mean what what have you i mean 
is there a common thread? What what do people need to be concerned about? Because I worry about what's on TV. Even some cartoons are maybe even have demonic spells. I mean, even just well, all the those different. things. All those things are catechetical in nature. Yeah, they're yeah. They're teaching. So what's interesting is that many people today won't pick up the Bible and read it. Many people as Catholics won't pick up the catechism and, and read it, but they'll read books on magic and casting spells, things that, things that have to do with the occult. Now, oftentimes people talk about different types of literature today. People oftentimes will bring up Harry Potter books. And I always say, okay, if you're reading those books, can you filter them through our faith? Mm -hmm. So that you can come to understand why components within certain types of literature that have to do with magic are inconsistent with our faith. But the yeah. sad reality is, I mean, if you ask a lot of kids today, could you name the Ten Commandments? They probably couldn't. You know, but if you were to ask them about spells and things they've read in these types of books, they could rattle them off right away. So I think the danger with with any of the things in our culture that are really leading us away from God, obviously, why would you get involved, watch those anyway? I mean, they're entertainment, I guess, you know, but if you don't have people that have people in the Catholic faith that do have a good formation, and that's a whole nother topic, but those who have a, a decent formation are much less, I guess, they do have that filter. They do have that worldview. Yeah, they're of, less likely to be drawn into that. Right. They might they, see those things and view them as maybe entertainment, or but they watch it and then is they move on. Right. It doesn't get a hook into them, and I think that's the danger today is that a lot of people are letting evil kind of get a hook into them because the devil works in very subtle ways. You know, uh, oftentimes it isn't jumping out and bah, scaring yeah. people. That's Here I am in my red great. suit. And <laughs> but oftentimes people get off track and they don't even realize they've been off track and perhaps even for quite a while. They just kind of slowly get pulled into, you know, the devil's game and then they end up abandoning their faith and they don't even realize it. So when people open up doorways to evil, they can do that either directly or indirectly, directly when they know they're doing things that are inconsistent with our faith. And indirectly, when maybe they're doing things they believe are just fun and entertaining, but don't realize that they could actually be opening up a doorway to evil in their life. For example, when people play with things like Ouija boards, you know, tarot cards and, and things like that, you know, getting your palm read. Again, you might think it's entertainment, but slowly people are being pulled into the world of the devil. So I think in one of the talks you gave, I think you were in Texas or San Marco Island. You gave a long talk there. It was a San Marcos, Texas. Yeah, Texas. Okay, and um, I think you gave six top six reasons why, or I think there were six reasons why people get or six entry six, points. Six, six entry points. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk about those real briefly? Because I thought that was really fascinating. I think that's something I want people to be aware of because the whole goal in this is to be aware so that you don't get into any of this and avoid it, you know? Sure. And there are many ways I think that people can open up a doorway to evil. But in the years I've done this ministry, I've identified some primary ways that I have seen, such as ties to the occult. And that has to do with things like psychics, medians, practicing witchcraft. You know, those types of things can be an entry point. Another one is being cursed by someone else practicing, you know, incantations. Now, curses are only effective if, if one is weak in their faith because we can't control what somebody else does, but we can make sure that we're standing firm in our faith. Other entry points, I, I talk about the entertainment industry. You look at the fascination again with certain TV programs or certain types of literature that can draw people in. Uh, life of habitual sin, where I think we're losing the sense of sin in society today is another way that we do that. Brokenness is another way that we invite evil in because God, you know, Jesus came to help us pull the pieces of our lives together to make them whole and complete. 
so that the day comes we can return our lives back to God the Father as something whole, but the devil constantly wants to break and fracture our lives because then all we have is a bunch of jumbled pieces and there's nothing to give back to God. Now, we all experience brokenness in our lives, but how we deal with it does seem to matter. Another avenue would be being dedicated to a demon. And I've worked with people who, uh, as children growing up, their parents or other family member or someone who had guardianship over them who practiced satanic rituals exposed them to that. So again, trying to determine the entry point helps the exorcist know what doorway needs to be closed. But it's not just a matter of closing the entry point. It's also about opening the door to God. So exorcism really is a form of evangelization. Yes, the devil is active in your life, but guess what? God wants to be active in your life as well. You just have to invite him in. And the ministry of exorcism is a way of helping people invite God more deeply into their lives, either for the very first time or if people have abandoned their faith, kind of helping them to reconnect. So I learned in that other talk that there are two types of exorcisms, one that a, a maybe a priest can do, and then one that would be a lay person. Or uh -huh. maybe even, even to, what I never heard that. What's the difference? In, um, and the other thing is like I've and I, I have this as one of the questions and we're running out of time. But because I know I said just 30 minutes, but I'll, I'll try to speed this up. But you can invite uh, me back. Okay, I will. I definitely will. Uh, we could do a whole series. But I guess the question is, what prayers? I mean, can you should you ever speak to Satan and cast him out in the name of Jesus? Because I've seen other Protestant prayers that that do that, and then I've also heard priests say, no, no, don't ever, don't ever, you know call Satan by his name. Don't ever enter in a conversation with him, even if you're trying to cast him out. So what does the exorcist say about that? And maybe give us the, <laughs> give us some advice okay. here. <laughs> well, there are two types of exorcisms. Okay. There's a major exorcism or imperative where a command is being given to a demon. And the church says that only a priest authorized by his bishop should perform those particular uh, rites. Now, what's interesting is that the bishop is the exorcist in his diocese. So every Catholic bishop is an exorcist by virtue of their office. And then they can bestow that charism on one of their priests, either on a stable basis or any priest can be authorized to perform one. But the church does also recognize supplicating or minor exorcisms, which are prayers directed to God, who is asked to bring relief into the life of the one who is suffering. And the church says that anyone can say a supplicating exorcism prayer. Again, it's a prayer directed to God, and we know that anyone can pray. But again, because an exorcism, a major exorcism, commands given to demons is a liturgical rite, the church has a prescribed way of saying that should be done. And even uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, the future Benedict XVI, in 1986, made a very clear distinction between uh, Prayers for deliverance, which I would call minor exorcisms, which anyone can say, and then commands to demons, which should only be said by the priest authorized to do that by his bishop. Now, some people will disagree with that and say that Jesus gave the, the ability to command demons to everyone uh, by virtue of their baptism. Mm -hmm. But again, the church does have prescribed ways of how things should be done. And I always think that it's never good to be in disagreement with the church or your bishop when you're trying to fight the devil, because yeah. the devil loves division, and we shouldn't go into that arena. So um, what have you learned over all these, I guess, 15 years now of, of doing this? I mean, I guess, what's, what have you learned in this process, you know? I mean... I, I know we, you could tell us so many cool stories, and I know people want to hear those. Maybe give us a cool story. I don't know if you want to do that. Um, well, I, I can tell you what I've learned is that I, okay. as an exorcist, it's, it's helped me to become a better priest. 
because in today's church, I think there are fewer priests. Priests are stretched so thin. The danger is that that priesthood becomes an occupation rather than a vocation. And to me, a vocation means a calling from God. So doing an exorcism ministry has helped me to rediscover priesthood as vocation, a calling from God. And because of that, when I deal with people that are up against the forces of evil, I'm not terrified by that. It doesn't scare me. People are always interested in what the devil is trying to do. You know, the manifestations, because the manifestations are meant to cause fear. You know, eyes rolled in the back of the head, the foaming at the mouth, growling, uh, bodily contortions. You know, I had a person one time, you know, their, their jaw dropped and moved off to the side when the demon was manifesting. I've seen people levitate during exorcisms. I've had people jump at me like wild dogs and growl. I've been cussed at up and down in every way that you can imagine. But the devil, to me, a good analogy would be it's like a wild dog who's trying to attack you. And in an exorcism, the church is chaining the dog so that it cannot hurt and harm people. And an exorcism, too, another way to look at it is that the church is commanding the devil to return that which he has stolen, namely a person created in the image and likeness of God. Because people can open up an, a doorway to evil directly or indirectly, but then we can choose to close that. We have free will. So even though we've begun to play the devil's game, we can say, no, I'm not playing anymore. Now the devil would say, no, 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 no. You can't go against it now that you've walked down this path. But again, we can choose to change conversion. And so in an exorcism, the devil is commanded to return that which he has stolen. Father Vince, I've, I got one more question. If Is it possible to get rid of the devil that you've entered in? Or if you have a demon, let's say in, in the worst case scenario, and one of the, I know there's all those different levels. Are there times when you just, absolutely do need an exorcist um or are there ways you can do it on your own and but maybe you don't even know and you know oh, yeah. the sacramental life of the church is is the best even father gabriel amorth the former chief exorcist of rome he says that a a, a good confession is better than an exorcism because when we confess our sins we're taking ownership of what we've done and we're handing them over to God. And once we hand it over to God, the devil can no longer use them against us. So it's the very ordinary aspects of our faith that people can use to defeat the devil. As Catholics, go to Mass, receive the sacraments, you know, go to communion, go to confession, pray. If we're doing these things, the devil's already on the run. You know, oftentimes people want the extraordinary to fight the extraordinary. But it's the ordinary that defeats the devil. You think of an exorcism, some of the things that are used, sacred scripture, prayer, holy water, reminding us of our baptism, a crucifix. You know, Jesus is dying on the cross. The devil believes it's the moment of his victory, but the moment of his victory becomes the moment of his defeat. And so the church literally takes the very things that the devil rejects and throws them into his face into an exorcism. And again, those things are at the very core of what it means to be a Christian. So again, it's the very ordinary things that we can do in our lives that will always keep the devil at bay. Okay, this is, I promise this is my last question. <laughs> I've got so many, but I've heard, and, and I've, I've actually experienced this myself once, but some, some people um, that they are getting closer to God or they um, are praying a lot or they're very, very holy. And that would not be me, but we're always working on that. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, Father, you know, Padre Pio and, I've, you know, Father Don Calloway and all these other people that, and he had a different story, but mm -hmm. you, you haven't necessarily opened up the door, but. That's, uh, that's demonic oppression. Demonic oppression means that God allows one to be afflicted by the devil as a way for that person to show their fidelity to God. So demonic oppression is a gift from God. 
Now that might seem strange to say that the devil in your life is a gift, but you mentioned uh, St. Padre Pio. We think of Job in the Old Testament, that God permitted the devil to afflict him. And even when Job has lost everything, he's covered in sores, he's, he puts on sackcloth, he sits in ashes, and his friends say, curse God and die. And what does Job say? He beats his breast and says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Meaning, if things be good, I glorify God. If they be bad, I glorify God. We think of uh, St. John Vianney. We think of Stephen St. Paul himself. He talks about the thorn in the flesh he received, the messenger from Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. So there are many, many examples of people that experience the demonic. You know, the thing about Padre Pio, I have a little book called The, the Devil in the Life of Padre Pio. He used to call the devil Old Bluebeard. <laughs> and he would say at night he would be trying to sleep and the devil would come and make all these noises so that he couldn't get any rest. That way he wouldn't be able to minister to people the next day. And in, in that book, one time Padre Pio comments, he's trying to sleep and the devil comes and makes all this noise and he turns over and he looks at him and he goes, oh, it's only you, Bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. And then he rolled over and went back to sleep. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, one of the funny things you said in one of your other talks, I think it was in Texas, I, it was after one of the, a pretty major exorcism that you did, the one that went on for a while, and um, yes. they asked you, what what'd you do afterwards? And you said, you went to Dairy Queen. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Dairy Queen and had a chocolate shake, and I walked in, it was a hot day, the place was packed, and I, I thought to myself, if these people knew where I just came from, I would be like Moses parting the Red Sea. They would get out of my way and I could go right to the front of the line. So that's going to be my new thing. You know, you, you, you fight you fight evil and then you go get a Dairy Queen. So, you know, that's, every, I, every time I drive by Dairy Queen, I'm going to be thinking about you, Father Vince, because uh, that's pretty awesome. Well, listen, when's your book going to be available and what's it called? Well, it's still in the, the, the title right now, which is subject okay. to change, is okay. Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Angels. And it's scheduled to be released in the early part of next year. Uh, so that would be the early part of 2021? 2021, yes. Okay, all right. Well, Father Vince, uh, well, I definitely want to have you on Catholic Radio, too, because I've been wanting to have you come close to October when, you know, all the mm -hmm. fascination with Halloween and all that. So we'll have to do that. But thank you so much for being my guest You're welcome, today. Bridget. My pleasure. And um, I'll, I'll get this to you when it's done, okay? Sounds great. I appreciate it. All right. Take well, God, care. Bless. God bless. Stay safe. Oh, do you want to give a blessing for our audience? Certainly. Yeah, do that. We, we can always use a prayer. So yes, we can. The Lord be with all of you and with yes, your too. spirit. May Almighty God send his blessing upon each and every one of you now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Did that, did that count as an exorcism for everybody? <laughs> No commands were given. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I'll keep that in mind. Well, Father Vince, thanks again. You're welcome. Take care. God bless you. God bless you too.